Hello. Hello. What's up? What's up? Hey, dudes. I'm Erin. I'm Nicole. This is Dude That's Fucked Up. And yeah. I'm hungover because I had wine last night during Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah, dude. I was stress drinking. <laughs> I was like... I was drinking like a beer and I was just like chugging it and I was like, oh fuck, what am I doing? Because yeah. I was like really stressed. I just like, well, and then like the stress turned to like celebration. So then it was like a whole wild ride. And yeah. I, uh, we had, we made this like, um, British pub feast. Like we, Pete made a mm. pot roast. And, oh my God. And we made, uh, um, Sunday roast. A Sunday roast. And we made, uh, popovers like Yorkshire, Yorkshire puddings. Lovely. And we just had like a lovely little thing and I drank wine out of my Game of Thrones goblet that I have. <laughs> How cute are you guys? Oh, oh my God. It was God. so I cute. Love yeah, I loved it. I was in such a good mood. And then, yeah, it was like stressful. And then I was like, oh no, we need more wine. And then I opened a second bottle and it was, uh, luckily we didn't get very far into the second bottle. So, but you know, Phew. I don't feel great. <laughs> I don't feel great. <laughs> I mean... It's rough stuff. It's rough stuff. Well, you almost crushed two bottles of wine and you ate a lot of pub food. So I, mean. I felt very on brand for Game of Thrones. Hell yeah. Yesterday. I love it. That's yeah. great. Mm -hmm. Well, we just actually we ate kind of insanely like Middle Earth y. <laughs> Middle Earth. That's Tolkien, I know. Uh we we ate very um uh, like in a hall with lords and ladies. Did you sort have of. a giant turkey leg for dinner? Oh, we ha we had a giant steak. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, we like made a steak and like a huge London broil, uh, and it was very good. Oh. And like potatoes and Brussels sprouts and stuff. So yeah. And I was just drinking a lot of beer. So. <laughs> I was like on a roll, like oh, in a tavern. Love it. Oh, yeah. We both, we had our little tavern Sunday. What a treat. What a treat. And Game of Thrones, I'm still processing from it. So I kind of want to watch shit. it again. I know. That, that was so fucking intense. Yeah. But also, I'm like, ooh, it's an hour and 30 minutes. And then it wasn't. And there's like... <laughs> There's it was like just an, all like the after fucking like an hour okay. of, cre of credits and then yeah. like a whole then, behind the scenes bullshit. Yeah, DJ always gets mad about the behind the scenes thing. He's like, they're literally just talking about what we just watched. Like, I don't care. And I'm like, okay, like I get that for like some shows. Like, um, I don't know. Like, there's certain shows where you're like, I don't need to see this. But like Game of Thrones, it's like, okay, I want to know some of the stuff that went into this. But uh, it was a bit much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just want to talk about Game of Thrones. But that's not why we're here today. No, no, no. Sorry, guys. We went on a tangent. <laughs> um, we're talking about something very crazy today. Uh, we'll talk. We'll get to that in a second. Yeah. But first, do you have anything fucked up this week? No, but I'm very curious about what yours is because um, it it may it's making me think of the labyrinth. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why. Uh, all I wrote in the notes is rats and fire. <laughs> uh, so okay, first first note, first fucked up thing for me. Uh. I. Have the doors and windows open on a beautiful spring day. Let Ooh. me just set the scene for you. Okay. It's lovely. It's like 72 degrees, sunny, oh. a little breezy. It had just rained. It smells sweet outside. <laughs> I open my back door <laughs> that looks out into the alley, and I'm like taking in the fresh air, and I'm holding Jack, and we're like looking at all the flowers and shit. And I look down the alley, and I look, and I see some movement on the ground, and I look closer, and it's two rats fucking in the alley. <laughs> like, like, I don't know how this works, but they were, like, doing it missionary style. It was oh. crazy. And I feel gross even talking about it because I, like, felt like I intruded on something very intimate because it was, like, <laughs> they were in a position, you know? And it wasn't, like, an animal. It was, like, they were animals mid fucking. Midcoitus. But – 
Yeah, but it was like really weird. And I was like, I, I don't know what I just saw and I feel really weird about it. And so now that I saw that, you all have to imagine it with me. Um, uh, well, I, that's fine. I'm imagining kind of like cartoon rats, but which isn't that gross. But now that I'm thinking about it, I'm imagining like animatronic rats. <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of, it was just like very, uh, it took me off guard and I was like, oh, and I like <laughs> turned away. I felt, I felt really dirty afterwards. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh. I'm sorry. Uh, oh my God. And then, so that was the rats. And then the fire <laughs> was that I almost burned down my house. Oh no. <laughs> with a candle. <laughs> Oh my god! Last night, yeah. during when you were getting in the mood for Game of Thrones, no, it was a couple days ago. Oh. I was like, uh, it was like, this is a stupid thing to do, and this is a PSA to not do this shit. Uh, uh-uh. So, like, you know, when your candles like about to run out, and there's like yeah. still like a lot of wax, but the wick like goes all the way down, and maybe like I don't know, I've done this before where I like put like a um, a wood match in there, and it like burns up. And it like stays, it's like the wax provides a fuel source kind of. And so it just like keeps burning. So, uh, but you shouldn't do this because it'll literally like consume all the wax and it'll just like make, it'll just like make a huge like little pit fire in there and it gets really fucking hot. Uh, And I've done it before and I've like shattered uh, like a, a, candle holder before so I know it's like a stupid thing to do uh and I don't know why I thought this was a good idea but it was like in a tin kind of one like a metal one so I was like oh it's it'll just burn out you know wait didn't you didn't you burn didn't you explode a candle while we were recording once yeah I think so (laughs) so yeah so I shouldn't have done that uh and I like walked out I had walked out of the room to like go get something in the kitchen and then I came back into the room and it was just like a fucking inferno and I was like oh that's not good and it was like flames going up and I was like okay there's like literal flames not just a flame and so I was like trying to blow it out and it was too big for that oh so I got I was like do I put something over it to like smother it or do I so I said no, I will get uh, my fucking uh, goddamn fire extinguisher that was, like, right there. (gasps) I get the fire extinguisher, and I, like, do it, and it doesn't fucking work. Like, the (gasps) fire extinguisher just, like, malfunction. So it didn't blow out. It, like, kind of, like, put a little bit of the fire retardant on it, but it just, like, it, like, sprayed everywhere, (gasps) and it didn't go out, and so it was still going, And this is how, like, kind of a big of a fire it was. And (gasps) so I get the watering can that I keep in our bathroom because it's, like, by our back door. Uh And I, like, filled it with water and I doused it. But when I doused it, it, like, made it, like, go up more. It was – because, like, the wax Because it was, like, oily. Yeah. Yeah. (gasps) It was so stupid. I'm so fucking dumb. Um, Oh, my God. And nothing, I mean, it didn't really damage anything. There's, like, soot on my wall and stuff, but, like. (gasps) Oh, my God. uh, Yeah. I am an idiot. Do not do that ever. I'm never doing it again. Just throw it away and buy a new fucking candle. They sell them at Marshall's for, like, $5. (laughs) God damn it. (laughs) Buy all your candles at Marshall's or TJ Maxx. Like, don't spend, like, a million dollars on candles, guys. Yeah, no, there's that's there's no need to unless you have, like, a favorite one that has, like, a very nice smell. But then, you know, you just don't leave a candle burning unattended. Yeah, and I'm I'm just so lucky I walked back in the room when I did because that's like it had just like flared up, you know. Oh my god! Uh, I, wait, I have a fire related so. story from this week actually. Okay. Um, my uh my brother, I went to my brother's house on Friday and he made us. He like he's like come over, we're gonna have like Korean barbecue. But oh my god, um, amazing! Yeah, he made like bulgogi and stuff and um oh. and little uh pork belly pieces and stuff and then but then we made banh mi uh which is not korean uh but whatever that's semantic it's vietnamese it's vietnamese right? yes but yeah, we but, but bulgogi is 
Korean. It was a whole, it was just a delight. It was a very fun time. Yes. Uh, we don't need to put a label on it. Anyway, so, uh, <laughs> so he, um, I guess before I got there, he had, he was making the bulgogi and like it dripped the like juices from it. You know, it gets like real yeah. thick and drippy. Yeah. And he like dripped some onto the, onto a bag of charcoal and it's like that fire oh, starter no. charcoal. And so it lit it on fire. <laughs> oh my God. And it wasn't even a flame. It was just like really hot juice from the meat. Yeah. And so I got there and he like had moved it and it was like over but under these like stairs next to his house and next to his apartment. And I, like I was just like talking to my, my mom and I like look over and the bag is just like on fire. And I was like, oh, hey, no. is that supposed to be on fire? And he was like, <laughs> nope. And he like has a hose. But instead of turning on the hose, he like went in and filled a pan with water and then just came out and poured it on and the fire went out. But it was still smoking. And I was like, I feel like that's going to happen again. And he was like, no, it's fine. I put it out. And I was like, okay. But then I'm just standing there watching it smoke. Yeah. And then I just keep checking on it. And we're like making sandwiches and we're going to take them down onto the beach. And my dad is there. And I and I like look over and I'm like, oh, yeah, uh, that's definitely on fire again. And my brother's like, no, it's not. I put it out. <laughs> and then he, I'm like, I just saw flames. And he's like, no. And then flames all of a sudden like poof. and I was like oh no and my dad and my brother went and turned on the hose and my dad like filled the whole thing with water and then like so then it was fine and my dad like moved him out to the curb but then I went into my brother's house to get a paper towel to take down to the beach with me or something and to eat my lunch and there's just a candle burning like uh. on this big thing and I was like I blew that sucker out and I didn't even say anything I was like this kid and his fire it is just Dude. unattended everywhere <laughs> uh, I'm telling you don't don't leave your flames unattended y'all don't yeah you flames should be attended all times uh I mean except if you're like fighting the white walkers like don't <laughs> leave that that fucking flame unattended <laughs> oh my god Ugh. uh okay well that's all of our fucked up shit yeah we love game of thrones um hope you guys too and if you don't I'm really sorry that you had to listen to us talk about game of thrones for like <laughs> a while <laughs> but barely not that long. but barely not also, that sorry. Not sorry. Yeah. Um. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Wait, one right. more reference I wanted to say earlier. No, I'm just uh, – well, yeah, I do want to say it because you were talking about flames and I wanted to be like, fl- 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 flames. flames. Flames on the uh, sides of my side face. Of my face. <laughs> <laughs> Clue. <laughs> yeah. Cl- okay. All right. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, speaking of flames on the side of my face, I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's a look. It's a look. It could be. You could like recreate that uh, if you wanted to. If you wanted to go out and like make a scene oh. with a cool costume, especially if you were in New York in the late 80s, early 90s, and you wanted to get into the hottest club. <laughs> <laughs> the hottest club in New York is Chud. Chud. <laughs> They have everything. <laughs> Cannibalistic humanoid underground dwellers. <laughs> uh, they have dinosaurs taking dumps. They have <laughs> the new New Jersey devil. <laughs> He's new and improved. <laughs> uh, uh, the new Jersey devil. The new Jersey devil. <laughs> Uh, well, yes, you guys, we are talking about the club kids of the 90s, late 80s, early 90s in New York City. What Ooh. a fucking time to be alive oh. and partying back then. Um, it was kind of a weird time uh, when all this was happening. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen Party Monster, the, uh, the movie with uh, Macaulay Culkin yeah. and Seth Green, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, very... Silly movie, but it's based on a true story. Mm. Um, it's based on all of these uh, young people that were dominating the nightlife scene back then. Um, so this is kind of, like I said, it was a weird time. 
the late 80s were mm, – it was strange. Like, we were coming off of a time of excess, mm-hmm. but also – and going into a recession, sort of, mm-hmm. of sorts. And there was also – the AIDS epidemic had just decimated the gay community in New York City. I mean, the entire country, but – uh Primarily, New York City Mm -hmm. was hit very hard. Um, And in 1987, Andy Warhol died. And that left a very large hole where the kind of like, he was like the kind of patron of saints of, patron saint of party, basically, in New York City and Mm -hmm. nightlife. He like would gather all these people and make them celebrities kind of uh, just for hanging out and partying, basically. Famous Ce- for being famous. Celebutants? Celebutants, yes. That, uh, this was the first time I've heard that word. I really like it. It's a fun word. <laughs> yeah, that was a term coined by um, uh, the Village Voice writer. Um, what's his last name? Uh, Gusto? Is it the Gusto guy? No, he's the um, Village Voice writer. Oh. I don't know him, but I did see that guy, the Gusto guy, who I recognized from, like, I love the 80s and Michael, stuff. Michael Musto. Michael oh. Musto. <laughs> not Gusto. <laughs> oh, my God. Same no, guy. No, this is, yeah. Different name. Yeah, he, yeah, th- he looks like a, a balloon animal or something. There's like a – he has like a very interesting look to me. Oh, I think he looks really nice. He's he's pretty famous. Like he's been – like he's always interviewed for this kind of like nightlife stuff and I don't know. He looks like he's his cool. head's going to like – like it's going to fill with helium and go off his body or something. <laughs> I don't know what it is. But yeah, he's in – he was on VH1 a lot, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. – He's always, like, on the, these shows about pop culture and stuff. So anyway, so, yeah, celebutant is a word coined by the writer Michael Musto, um, not, who is also in the club – not Gusto. Not Gusto. <laughs> <laughs> Who's also in the club kid scene. Yeah. So – or he was in the scene. He, like, was there when Warhol was around, and then he was there when the club kids were dominating. So Warhol mm-hmm. dies. There's this va- vacuum of left behind where nobody's going out anymore. And downtown New York basically is dying. Like there's no nightlife. Uh, and the city is disgusting. Like yeah. it had been going downhill for a while, but it's like really gotten bad. Um, and it's just like grimy and gross and everybody's like kind of – in this weird lull, I guess. But then these kids kind of all start banding together uh, and doing all this like underground kind of like punk shit, but it's like punk mixed with drag mixed with like, I don't know. Clowns? Ev- like everything. Clown- yeah. Clowns and fucking, you know, just anything you can imagine. Basically, it's like mm. anti-fashion. Yeah. So it's like all these alternative weird outcast young, outrageous, queer, just young kids just coming out of the woodwork. Mm -hmm. And um, they just kind of start making their own scene. And the way I was like, when I was reading about it and like watching this documentary, which is very good, uh, called Glory Days. Definitely watch that. D-A-Z. With a Z. -Z D-A-Z-E. It sounded to me like it was – it was because a lot of the the kids are like running away from home, or they had been kicked out of their homes or whatever because they were gay or or queer or whatever, and they were like wanted to get out of like their midwestern towns, and they just like basically ran away to join the circus and <laughs> live in New York. That's what it sounds like to me yeah. because like it was just so outrageous, and yeah. they literally dressed like clowns. So um, it was very interesting. Um, the I think the impetus for dressing like clowns was because like or just like dressing outrageously was there was this like weird kind of norm core boring mm. uh stifling uh, vibe happening in the city like with all the Wall Street people they just were like so anti that and mm. I think it's yeah. kind of what it what it seems like 
Yeah. And also, like, there is just all this – there was a lot of uh, – I mean, the west side of Manhattan was, like, abandoned and, like, gross. And there is just this opportunity to just make something out of nothing. So that's kind of, like, what happened. And so these kids just filled that void. And there's one person in particular who was uh, really just – gather. he was, like, gathering up all these kids and making these parties and just, like – crushing it and making it so fun and this guy his name was michael alleg and he was a party promoter Mm -hmm. and he just had this like way of he had this like style and this like charisma that really was perfect for this this point in time i guess yeah makes any sense well it's so funny too because everyone like it sounds like he was obnoxious and like people this documentary we watched like some people were saying like nice things about him but even uh-huh. the ones who said nice things about him would also say like awful things. I know. It was just like he was this immature, yeah, wild and I think that was just like the everybody was just like so desperate for some like spontaneity. Yeah. Um because everybody had just a lot of people had been through like horrible tragedy with uh, AIDS and yeah. um, all the the violence and crime in the city. People were like wanting just some fun and some lightheartedness. It seemed like, um, yeah. and, and that's they were what young. he and yeah, and they were young um, and just very irreverent. They didn't give a fuck about anything. They didn't care about any rules or like. They weren't trying to, they weren't out there trying to get fucking permits for anything. They were just like having (laughs) these like little underground parties. Mm -hmm. But then there were like some clubs that were like legit. Yeah. Um, And they were, so all these young people were out there. I mean, like that was like the thing to be back then, which is not really a thing anymore. I don't, I, due to the fact that the internet exists, uh, (laughs) being a club promoter (laughs) was like a thing. Like you had to have this like special personality and, you had to be really outgoing and just outrageous and attract a lot of attention. And that was the kind of uh, the MO of the, of the day, I guess. I feel like it's still – club promoters still exist in Las Vegas, which is weird. Yeah. I, like, come, like come, come to this club. We'll, I'll get you in VIP and you just have to pay $100. And how many friends do you have with you? And, like, it's very weird. It's like – it's like how how it's like how car sales people exist. It's like we don't need you anymore. Like we can just like go see how much this car is worth and buy it. Yeah. And <laughs> there's like really no such thing as haggling on prices anymore unless it's like a used car. <laughs> yeah, and you're like, uh yeah, because oh, it's so weird. What a weird I don't know. I yeah. I it's such a weird process. But yeah, this what a fun it sounds really fun. Yeah, and like I said, it was super, it was like a very DIY community. So in order for like these parties to exist, and for a, a, a you had to be a, a a personality to be a club promoter. You couldn't just like be like this boring person. You had to have the clout basically to get people mm. to want to come to the party. And then once you had that, you had to promote it obviously that was your job and back then there was like no way of doing that besides literally making posters <laughs> and like copy like printing out a bunch of fucking copies of <laughs> like you get xerox copies and you pass them out on the subway or whatever oh my god didn't they have two i don't know if this is a real thing but i saw a bunch of them they had like baseball cards did yeah, s- they had like trading cards. Yeah, for yeah, that's it wild, was crazy promo materials. Yeah, that w- they would like have all these like they'd have like pins and they'd have you know like and those are all like collectibles now. It's so cool. That's they were wild. like garbage pail kids. <laughs> <laughs> literally though, because they yeah, literally though they were gar- like a garbage outfit and a pail on their head. <laughs> seriously and like one of them like they all have like crazy names to all these like club promoters and like personalities in the scene that that were like known in the day they had like people named like 
pee drinking Alex or something <laughs> like, like it was just like, what is happening? But, and we'll talk about why that was a real thing, but yeah, it was just like a crazy time. So some of the more like, uh, popular clubs that became popular because of these club promoters and these, these club kids, uh, were, were like, uh, well, and I think this was a famous dance club before they came on the scene. Danceteria was <laughs> one of the huge fucking clubs. Uh, club USA, Tunnel, Limelight. Um, and there was a couple others that were just like super popular. And those were the ones that like they all did like the circuit. They'd go out to like a couple clubs every night, every night. Yeah. And it just sounded exhausting. To like 6 a.m. <laughs> but I remember seeing Limelight on, and I think this was way after it, this period, maybe, but I remember seeing Limelight on an episode of um, Sex in the City. I was going to say that. Yeah. <gasps> you were? Oh, yeah. I, 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 and like, and they, yeah, they were like trying to make it seem like <laughs> in Sex in the City, like this type of uh, like scene still existed. Yeah. In like the late 90s, early 2000s. And it it did not. No, but, for sure. Not. Uh, like, remember the episode with bed? Remember yeah. That one where well, they that like go bed, to the club and they lay in bed. Club That's bed real, was yeah. real. Yeah, yeah. And Limelight, yeah. I think um, we'll talk about like it was shut down for a little while and then they tried to reopen it. And I, I think that's when they had it in Sex and the City, but it wasn't like what it used no, to be. It wasn't the same. Yeah. No. And not, nothing was the same as like the heyday of when the club kids were like running all this shit. Yeah. What a weird, um, it's, uh, what a weird time, but like so interesting and all these things coming together, like yeah. rave culture and like, uh, yeah, just like, the early 90s. I don't know. It, it's wild to me that something like that even existed. And like couldn't – I feel like it couldn't exist today, I don't think. It's so I don't like think, underground. I don't, know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I Well, it was just like such a, um interesting little sliver of time. Mm-hmm. Like it was – like you know how Studio 54 was just like – it only was open for like 11 months or something. But it was such a big – like imprint yeah. on pop culture and society like and yeah. it, and it was it was like the epicenter of disco mm-hmm. uh and it wasn't even open that long but it seems like it was it was open for a lot longer because it was so impactful on on pop culture at the time or or just like culture period um yeah. and this is kind of how i don't know this kind of like reminds me of that Mm-hmm. But it lasted a little bit longer than Studio 54. But all these clubs were kind of like that. The hype was just really big. And if you lived in New York at the time and you like went out to these clubs, I am so jealous. Like it seemed oh like God. it was such a fucking blast. Um, so Dude. back to Michael Alig really quickly. I mean, we're going to talk about him probably here on out. But um, – he was so good at what he did that he was hired by um, the people who ran a club called Limelight. Um, and Limelight was cool because it was in an old church and it was like very subversive, the fact that this like nightclub was in an old church. But at the time that Michael took it over, it was not cool. Like they called it Slime Light and it was just like, <laughs> It was not, it was just like not cool. It was like one of those places where everybody was like, oh, I don't want to go there. But he turned everything around. He had all these uh, crazy parties there, like all these theme parties. They do just weird shit all the time. And he started doing these Wednesday night uh, parties called uh, Disco 2000. And middle of the week, this place would get fucking packed. And Mm. it was, it was the most popular club in all of New York, and people were losing their minds over it and trying to get in the door on a motherfucking Wednesday. <laughs> oh, my God. Like, young, just, like, so many different kinds of people, too. Like, it it was wild to me that, um, like, young, young teenagers were partying there. Yeah, that was the thing that was weird, too, about this time is uh, New York City had just raised the drinking age or – the, yeah, the drinking yeah. age had just been raised to 21. Yeah. Um, but like still. Like right around like 1990. So, yeah. So like they had to have these parties with 
eight, it, I think it was like 18 and up. And it was just like all these really young kids hanging out at these clubs. So, Wild. um, but it looks so fun. Like all oh the pictures God. and videos from this time. Um, they just were having a crazy debaucherous, just, it was insane. So this Disco 2000 party, they would do like weird contests. Like this is where they would have pee drinking contests <laughs> where where people would come in and like literally drink their pee on stage. And that's like how some of these dudes got their nicknames. Like, no, P. I- Alex. <laughs> No, you said, yeah. You said P. Alex earlier. Yeah. God, why are – oh, don't do that. That's so gross. The, those are the types of people I hate so much, like just doing gross things or being like just so sophomoric and obnoxious in a way yeah. that is like not funny. Like, Yeah, what? that was this. <laughs> oh, that is this. Yeah, I don't know if I would have had fun there. I feel like it looked fun and I like the dressing up part. And, like, I would love to do, like, crazy wild costumes, but, like, I don't think I would have liked the music, and uh, I definitely would not have liked people on stage drinking their pee. Yeah. It was just all these people from all over, all different scenes, kind of coalescing. Uh, There was, like, rooms of DJs. It was huge. There's lights everywhere, lasers. Um, it's literally everything Stefan talks about on SNL. <laughs> oh. Like that is that is the aesthetic that it's it's just fucking weird. Um, it's, and it it's funny because like right before I saw this in the notes, I was thinking, oh, now I can see like where Stefan is like where he was born from. Do you know what yes, I mean? Yeah, exactly. That I'm is like, the oh, origin. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So there is. Like, a lot of these promoters, obviously, like, they man the door also, Mm -hmm. and they would be the judges of who would get in and who wouldn't, and there was, like, tiers of who was getting in. Like, there's a top tier, like, A's, B's, D's, and, you know. Yeah. And uh, so if you weren't dressed wild or look fun, you were not getting in. (laughs) Or unless you had the money, because uh, they still needed people to pay and yeah (laughs) and like buy things in there but yeah like you really had to be like outdoing yourself every week even you know like or trying to outdo the regular people who like were the scene uh, vips at the time you know like yeah i don't know it sounds it sounds difficult honestly and like a lot of time and money would be spent trying to keep up and like keep on yeah in ahead of like what everyone's doing. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's it sounds wild. And it's like I think uh it was just a lot of energy, a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Um and like I said, it's a lot of DIY, so you had to be creative. Mm-hmm. Um and then another thing that Michael did was have these outlaw parties where you it's like a basically a guerrilla style like pop up party where they would just like go to a Burger King or a McDonald's <laughs> or a bank or the subway and just like have a party in these like teeny tiny little places <laughs> and party fucking hard. They like bring a boom box and just like lights and glow sticks and everybody would be in these insane costumes and dancing around people just trying to eat their fucking Big Mac. <laughs> uh, and it was wild. And then the cops would come and shut him down within like 10, 15 minutes. And then they'd scatter to these these clubs. So <laughs> this club had everything. The Hamburglar, the Burger King, <laughs> Whopper Juniors with cheese, Whopper Juniors without cheese, <laughs> chicken fries, a McDonald's play place, <laughs> <laughs> hot cakes, yeah, a ball pit. A ball pit, yeah. A happy With meal. child's pee all over it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and a, um, an abandoned happy meal. An unhappy uh, meal. <laughs> <laughs> you know the thing of where a child eats half of a, a happy meal after begging to go to McDonald's when the mom's like, we have food at home. But they beg and they beg and then they get it and then they only eat half of it. <laughs> And then the other half, they ate too fast, so they puke it up. That's an unhappy meal. 
<laughs> uh, anyway. Um, so, yeah, crazy times. Uh, RuPaul was part of the scene. Yeah. She was out there getting her best life. Uh, I watched, like, most of an episode of Geraldo that they all the club kids were on because that was the thing. People were so shocked by this behavior and this way of going out and partying that they'd, like, have – like Phil Donahue and Geraldo and all these like daytime talk shows, they'd have the club kids on because they couldn't understand how, like what their deal was. And so God. it was just like there people were so fascinated by it. Um, it wasn't like, I, I mean, looking back, it's like not that crazy. They're just, you know, weirdos partying. Like who cares? Dude, but I mean, that's yeah. us now. We don't, we don't, we're not, we're like totally desensitized by all this shit because of the internet. <laughs> well, and also I feel like we, like it's rude to be like, ooh, it's the other, you know, like that's all, mm-hmm. that's what that was. It's like people gawking at like people who are the other. It's like, oh, these kids are queer and they're like, you know, playing, they're, they're playing with like gender and all this stuff. And like now today we're like all accepting that a lot more in society. So it's not something that is appropriate and it probably never was to like gawk at, you know, but back then it's like, well, and I would argue too that a lot of these, the people that were, you know, part of the scene that they needed a outlet for their expression more than anything. And so this was how they did it. And they wanted to be in, they wanted to be seen. They wanted to be on TV. This was like, instead of having, I mean, if, if the reason this can't exist today is because the internet has too much already, like you, you can access this so much easier back then it was such a novelty. So Anyway, so RuPaul was was part of the like she'd be at the parties. Amanda Lepore was a big personality then. Mm-hmm. Uh, Richie Rich, James St. James. Um, it's yeah, Jane Saint, it was. Is, uh, is James St. James the one with the spider hair? <laughs> <laughs> that picture you sent to me where it's just a literal tuft of hair on a bald head. <laughs> but it's like really low on the forehead. It's like. It's so it's, bad, guys. It's like the re- whole head is shaved, but then there's a tuft of hair in the front. And then there's like oh four dread, like really thin, like oh rat God. tail dreads coming out of the tuft. And it looks like spider legs. <laughs> It's so bad. It's oh the worst God. thing I've ever seen. And that's a that is just a uh uh that's just like a, a cornerstone of their philosophy is just being as ugly as possible oh. and is just like anti fashion as possible. So I like yeah. I like that idea. It was, uh, if you if you had to um if you were a club kid and you had to come up with mm-hmm. an outfit and a name or either or what would it be what would you do oh my god um shit i don't know i think this I, requires a lot of thought i feel like i don't I know. know sorry i kind of threw it in there but. wait okay i think i got one okay, okay since okay. it's diy yeah, i yeah. would gather up all the cat hair that's <laughs> around my house and make some sort of outfit out of it or like I don't know, like braided into my hair or something. Oh my god, there's you can a make lot like, of fucking cat hair. You can make like a cat ear headband with uh-huh. c- actual real cat hair on it, like furry, yeah. like a furry headband with cat ears on it, but with real yeah. cat hair. And I'm not talking about how like there's people out there who like make yarn out of cat hair that's like really nice and soft. Uh, and that's really cool. But I would – it would be gross. Like I would make it – like Ooh. it would be like the chunks of, of fucking like gross hair that are just like collecting dust on the stairs. <laughs> 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 like it, there's a little cat litter in there like <laughs> – Oh, yuck. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel what like – What about I, you? Well, I would want to do – I don't – I've just been like thinking about um, – 
well, one, the uh, live action Flintstones movie lately. I don't know why. I just oh, have been thinking about that. Oh, my God. That's- With John Goodman and Rick Moranis. Yes. <laughs> and uh, uh, and Elizabeth Perkins and Rosie O'Donnell, who is oh, that's right. Betty Rubble. Um, uh-huh. Okay, but this is not where this is going. And Halle Berry's in that, too. Shit. Yeah, she is. She's like the office... Like, is she like a secretary? In She's that? Mr. Slate's like a secretary. Oh, oh my yeah. God. How do I know? This is like just tumbling out of my mouth. Kyle like how- Mc- and Kyle McLaughlin is Mr. Slate, right? Oh my God. I he's in it Holy somehow, shit. but he's the villain somehow. Oh my God. It's just like all coming back to me. So I know. it's like. I really wow. want to watch it. Anyway, so, but I really like the B-52s in that movie. So then I was thinking. <gasps> oh my God, B-52s. I'm obsessed with B-52s. Me too. Me too. Sorry. I would go the, but this movie is too cute for this scene, but I would want to yeah. do like a weird beehive hairdo with like things in it, mm. like animatronic mm-hmm. bees or like maybe mm. I would, maybe I would serve you honey out of it into your, Ooh. into your uh, mushroom coke cocktail <laughs> you're yeah. like whatever yeah. crazy drug cocktail you're drinking uh that michael alex serving you uh i will put like little honey in it or like i don't know but mm. some some sort of like beehive shape is what i'm thinking anyway i love it she yeah. is serving you <laughs> literal honey <laughs> wait <laughs> oh my god i have to tell you pete and i've been playing this game well, I play it with Pete, uh, and I just think it's funny. And sometimes then he'll play it, play it back. But I go, I'll just go out of nowhere. Category is, and then I'll like make up a category. Like, oh my god, what a fun exercise! Yeah, and I I go category is coffee time, honey, or whatever. And then he'll <laughs> and then uh, and then he'll have to do like a little runway walk and like. <laughs> And act it out, whatever oh it is. God. It's very fun. And and make little puns. It's very fun. Oh, my well, God. Well, I'll play it with you next time I see you. It's very fun. Oh, oh my God. I'm so excited. <sighs> All right. Uh, so, anyway, <laughs> these parties are fucking off the chain. Everybody's having fun. But, of course, as... Everything is want to do. All good things must come to an end. So, and that end comes about by way of uh, lots of drugs. Oh, um, drugs, drugs, all the drugs. All the drugs. Um, category so, is drugs. <laughs> category is drugs. <laughs> category honey, is. I am serving. <laughs> honey, I am serving you a K hole. You are trapped in a K hole with me. Uh, help! Let me out I, of this K hole. Maybe my that that would be my club kid name, Special K. I don't know, oh. but like K for a a kitty. Oh ooh, yeah, yes, bitch. Hey, um, kitty girl. But yeah, it's hey, your kitty word. girl. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Oh my god. So, all right, Michael. Michael a- Alleg is. Doing all the drugs. He never used to do drugs, though. He was, like, very, like, he wasn't straight-laced. He was, like, insane and crazy, and he would (laughs) act drunk and act high all the time. Uh, But he didn't really do drugs. He he thought that it was kind of scary and made people act weird, but he was already acting weird. Uh Um, Just, like, to, I think, to level up with everybody, he just, like, made it an act. Because, like, everything... Everything was a joke. Like everything was satire. The the whole entire vibe was just all playing this game, basically. Yeah. But then he started to dabble in ecstasy. Like that was the drug du jour. Um, and the I mean, it's like the classic club drug. Mm. And then people started bringing in special K. And then there was fucking cocaine, which cocaine kind of fell out of fashion so meth came around and then heroin really (gasps) really entered into the equation so he had started just doing all these drugs after not even doing them at all and um starts putting drug dealers on the payroll at these clubs because like he wants people he wants people like literally walking around the club giving bumps to party goers and he just like wants there to be a continuous party and wants everybody to have fun um 
as much as possible. And drugs are like a good way, good, quick and easy way for that to happen. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, the police at this time had started cracking down on like everything. So Rudy Giuliani became the mayor and he's a fucking insane person, as we know. Yeah. Um, but he had just been elected and that was his like number one goal was to mm-hmm. clean up New York because it was a fucking mess and it, it something needed to change. But he was uh, – he was – he is very problematic still to this day about how it all went. Yeah. Well, I feel like he – yeah, he went about cleaning things up the wrong way. Also, I think – I mean, it's like no one's dealing with the problem. Like, why are all these people out on the streets, you know, doing drugs right. or selling drugs or, or you know, uh, why is there so much crime and all that stuff? And it's like, you know, you have to, like, solve the problem, which is that people aren't, don't have jobs that pay them the living wage. And, all you know, it's like all this. There's other. Right. But instead, he just, like, fucking removed everyone who looked homeless or, like, did, you know, was selling drugs. He just, like, got rid of everyone and pushed them out. He, they would arrest – they would arrest people for nothing. Like – Yeah. And they'd, they'd do it and ask questions later, which is, as, is, as you know, a complete viola- violation of everything. Yeah. Of well, all of your rights. That's profiling. And, uh, yeah, but he – uh. There was a, the owner of the Limelight, I forget his name, Peter... Peter Gation. Gation, yeah, Peter Gation. He, um, basically, Rudy Giuliani, like, f- had a laser beam focus on Peter Gation and was like, this guy owns four huge nightclubs, I know these kids are doing drugs, which they were, but like, you know, it's like, whatever, just let people do their thing. But he's like, we're cracking down on this. They're partying till six in the morning. They have their boys are dressing like girls and girls are dressing like boys. And we have to take yeah. the, you know, it's like some fucking old man, old white man rant. Uh, and so he just got so hyper focused on limelight that he wouldn't stop until he took down Peter Gation, which he uh, eventually did because he put Limelight under investigation, um, which at this point was like an international club. There was locations all around the world. Um, yeah, Peter Gation was like a really good businessman, and he yeah. he was Canadian, so he was he had that international flavor as it was. Yeah, um. <laughs> uh, it's funny because I don't think of Cana- like I don't think of Canadians no. as having international flavor, but no. Uh, that flavor is maple. I um, think he was French Canadian, so oh, okay, okay. Sorry, yeah, that's definitely flavorful. Uh, that's got that's uh that cocoa van flavor. That's that uh, uh <laughs> poutine <laughs> flavor. Um, oh my god. Yeah, but uh, so anyway, so Limelight was uh, eventually shut down in 1996 because they were investigating, and so like all these people, a lot of people like lost their jobs. Um, yeah. Which was very sad. Yeah. um, And during this time, too, like right around this time where things started getting cracked down on, um, there was also some – like Michael was going down this like really bad – this is all going parallel at the same time. Like the the club was getting popular. Then it started getting – everybody started getting really into drugs, started getting really dark. And Michael was getting really into drugs. And he uh, had, like, a lot of people that would just, like, hang out with him to, like, they wanted to be part of the clique or whatever. Mm -hmm. And there was one kid in particular, Andre Angel uh, Melendez, who was hanging out. And he was – I don't think he was, like, specifically a drug dealer, but he – I think he did deal drugs to all these club kids. And, like, that's why he was included in – like the hang sessions and parties that they had. Um, he wore wings. That was his, his signature because um, mm. his nickname was Angel. And mm. um, when – and so he was hanging out with Michael a lot. and But Michael like thought he was like kind of a clinger and so he like had a little disdain for him. Mm. Um, but like I think they lived together or he was like around a lot at, at Michael's apartment and yeah. at one point, 
they like get into uh, an argument because Michael, because he's doing so much drugs, so many drugs, he like owes Angel a lot of money for all the drugs that he gets from him Mm -hmm. and he hadn't been paying him back. So they eventually start like having some beef and Angel's at his apartment one night and this is March 17th, 1996. Um... Angel's trying to get the money from Michael and they get into it and something very bad happens. Uh, This is very bad. (laughs) Get ready. Dude, I got kind of confused, uh, but I think it's because there's like a lot of different storylines or or a lot of different like um, the details are all different. And that's because Michael Alec and this other guy, uh, Robert D. Uh, Robert D. Riggs, who goes by the name Freeze, we would just call him that. <laughs> uh, which, what a name! Isn't that the bad? Isn't that one of the bad guys? Oh no, it's Ice in Hocus Pocus. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Ice. you were gonna say Mr. Freeze, like from Batman. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, mm-hmm. no, but uh, so so this guy Freeze, he's at. Alex's house, Michael Alex's house, and he like hears this little tiff that's happening, and he comes in, and ap- apparently or allegedly, I guess, um, Michael's like, "Help me, help me!" And he comes around the corner with a hammer, and he whacks Angel on the head, the back of the head, three times, and he's unconscious. And they're like, "Oh shit." But then they're kind of like super high on drugs. They're like doing heroin and stuff. So they're like fucked up. And they're like, well, we, you know, oh shit, we knocked him out. We'll just, let's put him on the couch and we'll leave him there. And like, you know, he'll wake up in a a little bit with a headache, but like we'll deal with it then. Um, So they leave him and then they come back like who knows how long later because they're so high. They come back they to check on him. He's still unconscious. They're like, okay, let's fill up the bathtub with water. We'll dunk his head in it. The cold water will, like, wake him up, and then it'll be fine. And they so they, like, took him into the bathroom, dunked his head underwater, and it he doesn't wake up. No bubbles are coming out. Nothing's happening. And they're like, oh, fuck, because he's dead. Yeah. <sighs> they killed him. They killed his ass on accident, but Dude, was it an accident? Kind of know. on accident. Yeah, we don't know. Uh, so so then they're still fucked up. They're like, oh god. So they uh drain or they put him in the tub. They don't know what to do. They leave him. They they go do more drugs to like try and forget about what happened, or maybe to try and figure something out. We don't know. Then they come <laughs> back, and then they're like, oh yeah, this guy's dead. Let's fill the tub with ice. To, like, keep him, you know. To preserve his body. To preserve his body and while we figure (laughs) out what we're going to do. Which, Uh. it's like, okay, this is going very sideways. um, And it is not good. And they don't really know what to do. So then (sighs) they're really freaked out. And they they know they need a plan. Because... At this point, they should have called the cops, obviously, a long time ago. But they're on drugs. And I think people that do drugs don't normally call the cops. uh, (laughs) Because they could get in trouble for a lot of stuff. And they're not... But they're not thinking clearly. Like, obviously, this man's life is is important. And they should have called the cops way earlier. Probably when they hit him. um, Or when there was, like, a dispute happening. But they didn't. So, anyway, they have a dead body. And they're like, oh, my God. So then um, Freeze talks Alig Alig into uh, a plan, which is I'm going to go to Macy's. Freeze is like, listen, I'm going to go to all places. (laughs) Freeze is like, I'm going to go to Macy's and get some knives. I'm not going to Kmart. Those things are cheap. I'm not going to. (laughs) I don't know what else existed back then. (laughs) But uh, yeah, I'm going to Macy's. I'm getting those high end butcher knives. I'm going to come back. (laughs) You're going to cut him into pieces and I'll give you 10 bags of heroin. Uh, and do you think they use like Wusthof knives or something? <laughs> like what do you think? <laughs> or I don't know. Well, I, I know I wanted to make a joke about like Martha Stewart collection, but that wasn't around then. So No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like these are fucking insane people. Criminals yeah. now. They're like this was their friend, first of all, which is so fucked up. And they yeah. – Uh, this makes me sick to my stomach 
And then they're like, fuck, we got to, like, get rid of this body. And so, <sighs> anyway, Alec, who at this point hadn't committed th- the initial crime and still was, like, not reporting the body, which I'm sure is a crime. Uh, but, like... Yeah, because then he became an accomplice. Well, yeah. I think he, he was... You do by, by like aiding and abetting right like he's like helping in a way but but yeah up until this point he hasn't like done an act right i guess uh he, i don't he, know but it's like if you know that like a crime has been committed and you haven't you're you don't go to the police like you're you're you're, you're in, in on it you know you're in, you're trouble. in on the crime yeah you're in trouble yeah, but so they it got they, worse they just like they just like carried on like nothing happened and they like had got these knives and they're like, we have Oof. to dismember him because they like couldn't pick him up. It, he he became he started decomposing in the oh. bathtub. They like poured Drano and put him on ice and poured Drano all over his body, put him on oh. ice, and that like kept him preserved for like a little bit. But like in all, he was like sitting in this bathtub for like a week, a couple of days. And, yeah, yeah. And then they they decide they're just gonna dismember him because that's the only way they could figure out how to get him out of the tub yeah like, that's their solution <laughs> they have to get they're like we have to get rid of his body but i don't think alec at this point like it he was didn't want to do that he was like no but then freeze was like okay but i'll give you 10 bags of heroin and he was like okay allegedly yeah. allegedly allegedly i don't know um so they did that they got their macy's knives uh with a gift receipt no <laughs> They got their Martha Stewart home collection knives, uh, and they fucking po- this poor angel man. They cut off his arms and legs and put them in duffel bags, and then they found a box in the in the building basement, and they put his torso in it, and they went to the fucking Hudson oh. River, and they just threw all this stuff in there. First of all, they didn't just take the box to the fucking Hudson River. They called yeah. a cab, a motherfucking cab, and put the goddamn torso in the box in the fucking trunk of the cab. And the cab driver's like, oh, what y'all have there? An old TV or something? And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's an old TV. It's a, it's a bunch of clothes that we don't want anymore. And he's like, they're like, yeah, just drive us to the Hudson River. We're just going to throw this box of old junk in the river. And the cab driver's like, okay. And they're like, hey, it's kind of heavy. Will you help us? And the fucking cab driver literally like help them throw this fucking box of a torso into the Hudson River and they thought it would sink but it sure as shit didn't it floated and it just floated on down the fucking Hudson River Dude. and they were like oh fuck <laughs> and the fucking cab driver did all this for $20 yeah <laughs> he's and like he, i want $20 and were, yeah and they were so fucking dumb and high that they had the they had the cab driver pick them up from their place and then drive them back to their house so they could have easily like been identified like if the cops ever looked into it like if they you know it was just so stupid Uh. um this motherfucker is he they're just gone their their brains are totally fried from doing so many drugs and eventually the body washes up on staten island the torso i should say i don't know what the fuck they did with the arms and the legs i think they did something separate with that well but, maybe the duffel bags but, sunk or something but yeah the bot the torso in the box eventually washed up on shore but it was like months later because this happened in march uh and it didn't yep. wash up onto a shore until november of the same year yeah and kids found crazy it, which is so sad oh my god and the body was so decomposed at this time that they couldn't identify it they like the cops had no idea like who this person was, this this torso was that they had found. It was it was a mess. It was gross. It was but terrible. Al- also, and the cops the- weren't even oh. looking for him because they they could give a shit. You know, like it was just like some yeah. some kid, some you know, gay Hispanic kid from New mm-hmm. Jersey or whatever who was who sold drugs who. What, just went to this club that they just, you know, had shut down and they're like, yeah, whatever, like not important. And so yeah. the cops didn't really care and nobody questioned Alec until because he's a fucking idiot. He's, they started telling people they killed him. Yeah. He like Michael was going around like literally just saying all the details of the murder, like 
we killed Angel. We put his body like because people like people in the in the in the clubs were like, "Where's Angel been?" Like they there were people who were friends with him, who loved him, who were like very concerned, hadn't seen him in a long time, and were like, yeah. "Where did he go?" And Michael be like, "Oh, I killed him. I chopped I chopped up his body and put him threw him in the Hudson River." And everybody was like. What the fuck? Why would you say that? And he's like, I, I'm just joking. But really, he wasn't. He was literally telling the truth. And everybody oh just God. like kind of dismissed him, but also were very disturbed by it. Um, Gruesome. Because you have to remember. You oh, have yeah. to remember. He was like the the whole vibe had started out really fun. And then it just like gradually got darker and darker. And mm-hmm. a thing that really didn't help Michael in this whole situation was that he had had a party that was like a fucking blood theme, like a blood ritual theme or something where the the, the posters for the, the party were literally like a decapitated head with a fucking hammer, which is the exact murder weapon that was used to murder angels. So, oh my God. and this had this party had happened a year before and everybody that knew Michael knew he was like obsessed with death and murder and stuff. So he just like didn't have a great case for himself when he eventually got caught. <laughs> Cuz he got caught. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's like he <laughs> uh people are talking about it. So like yeah, everyone on the scene too was just like kiss asses, you know? They're like yeah, he, they wanted to still get into the clubs, and yeah. Michael was still like, I don't know. Yeah, because just because the limelight was shut down, there were so many other clubs that he was still hosting events at. They were still partying every night and doing tons of drugs, but at this point, it was because they felt shitty about what had happened, and they were like trying to like, you know, bury that. But also, Michael was going downhill with the drug use. He started getting. I mean, he was like heavily into heroin at this point, and yeah. uh, he he started to lose it. Um, I think all the guilt, obviously, from participating in a murder, and mm-hmm. just you know, he was severely addicted to drugs. So, yeah, he they get caught. The whole yeah. thing falls apart. He admits everything. There's like there's a lot of stuff to this that happened in this trial where the like. The district attorney was just – they wanted so badly to crush all the, like, clubs and all the people who were doing drugs in the city that they wanted him to testify against all these people that were in the scene. And he's like, "I, you're literally – I'm be make, you're making up lies and I'm not going to lie. I just murdered somebody. Like, why – I'm not disputing that. But they wanted to use him, basically – to get all the like to catch all these other people and that just didn't happen so yeah uh, like peter gation they're like we don't like yeah hopefully they're like you know what let's give them both a plea deal maybe they'll testify against this guy later but i don't i don't think he ever had to and they ended up only getting so they both pled guilty to a charge of manslaughter each Mm -hmm. um free served uh, 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 they were sentenced to 10 to 20 years in prison. Freeze ended up serving 12 years and Michael um, s- s- ended up serving 14 years. And that's it. Oh, no, no. Sorry. 18. 18, 18 years. Yeah. 17 or 18 years. Yeah. For- 14 and 18 years. Yeah. Freeze was 14. He was 18. And that's it. And that, and you know, uh, Michael, ha- he was in solitary confinement because he like, he could have been released a lot sooner, but he didn't do great in jail. Like he was, I mean, mm-hmm. nobody does great in jail, but he was like, he, his behavior wasn't like, he uh, was not good <laughs> fit yeah, yeah. to be released. Well, he was still doing a lot of drugs in jail. Um, yeah. And, and then he blames the movie Party Monster on why he didn't get paroled the first time. Cause he was like, oh, everyone saw that movie and thought I was like such a monster and da da da. But it's like, I don't know how much that had to do with that. He was doing heroin in prison and they kept finding it in his system so yeah uh, exactly anyway yeah he got out so and like this whole documentary like uh you see the whole process of him at the end getting released from prison and like just going right back to the people that he had surrounded himself with um in the party scene which some of them are totally, you know, normal people now and they have, you know, put a lot of that life behind them. But then some of them have continued living their lives and probably reminded him of that time. And mm-hmm. I, it must be so jarring 
because he went to prison right before the internet was a thing, like a real thing. He went to, he has no concept of what New York was like or how to deal with anything in modern life, truly. Um, like a so cell he had phone. To re- like yeah, a smartphone. Had- a smartphone, yeah. He had no idea how to, like, function. Yeah. So all these people that he had been friends with kind of rallied around him. And even though they, like, knew he was a murderer and it just – it was so strange to see the whole – yeah. He's extremely frank about everything. He's so – he, like, doesn't downplay anything really. I mean, kind of he does. Like, he has his story of what happened, but, like – and who really knows. Yeah. But I, I don't know, man. It's just, like – it seems, like, unhealthy to literally go right back into the same group of people that you were around when you did all this bad shit. I don't know. Well, I mean, it didn't end up – being a good idea yeah because he i think he got um arrested a couple years ago for uh possession of meth so oh. he started doing drugs again eventually and i think he might be in jail again but i'm not sure um but yeah yeah it, that's it's, definitely a violation of his parole <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> oh yeah uh also um i was a little bit surprised at how he did not age as poorly. Well, I don't actually know how old he is, but he didn't seem to age as poorly as a lot of the other people interviewed in that documentary, which let that be a lesson to you about drugs and how much of them you choose to do. Oof, yeah. Uh, Because it was not pretty for a lot of them. (laughs) Well, I mean, he wasn't doing, he was doing drugs in prison, but he wasn't doing the volume of drugs that he could have been doing out outside yeah. of prison true that oh but man it makes me real happy that i didn't get into drugs in my 20s uh yeah and abuse them in any way and and i didn't even party as much as i would have liked to and i think that's a good thing now yeah <laughs> i i did my fair share of partying but not nothing close to what these kids were doing back then yeah and no. obviously not enough drugs to murder somebody so no. <laughs> thank goodness and i mean that was like the whole downfall of this whole entire scene this whole time of the it, what started out to be this like fun silly irreverent you know offensive but still like a you know, safe place for misfits turned out to just be a shithole once drugs really got into the into the scene. So go figure. Yeah, it was. It, it, you know, it, it uh, it's sad, but yeah, that's what happened. And this was a, a just a very interesting time in our history. <laughs> yeah, it was wild. It was wild. <sighs> So, yeah, that's uh, basically what happened. I don't know what's going on with Michael A. Like these days. I think he's on Twitter. He's probably, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, trying to, maybe I, trying to make a comeback. We don't know. I don't, I don't think know. this could exist. I don't know. It's it's all, we, I don't know. I just like don't really see counterculture making movements like this. Yeah, I mean, I was... I I pose the question: Who are the club kids of 2019? And the only thing, the only you know things I could think of were like these kids who go to like every festival, like Festival Rats, uh, EDM like lovers, YouTube stars, and maybe Instagram influencers. I don't know. But even all that is like so popular, or like. Like even the EDM, it's mainstream. It's like, yeah, it's yeah. mainstream. It's all it's all very mainstream, but maybe yeah. we don't know about the countercultures that are like emerging because we're not. That's in the, the thing. Scene. Yeah, we're we're a couple of just you know boring basic bitches that don't know what the fucking kids are up to these days. And I mean, we wouldn't know because this generation that's come up behind us is. They're, the internet is native to them. Like they are very wary of their privacy. They understand more about the internet than anybody in Older. any other generation does. Yeah, any, yeah. So, so uh, you know, 
and they're bending it to their will. Like, and we, we won't even know like what's, what's happening before it's like, they'll have already moved on to the next thing by the time it's reported in mainstream news. You know what I mean? I feel like maybe the equivalent of this today is those, um, like hobby horse, uh, competitive, (laughs) those hobby horse athletes where it's like, they, they do. gallop around on the fake horses. Uh, I don't know, but you haven't lived until you watch Quidditch on ESPN like nine or whatever. What? It's <laughs> real. Oh, God. Yeah, that's real. So maybe it's all that. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, yeah I things don't I don't want to be a part of, so I'm fine with it. <laughs> yeah. That's you. That's them. <laughs> uh but yeah, right. it was a crazy time and uh, we weren't old enough to partake. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I remember like seeing the shit like on Geraldo and whatnot, but not. It, I, I, I don't know. I, yeah. I have nothing to compare it to now. So no, I mean, except our like little scene days at the fucking till Tuesdays. But that yeah, was no, nowhere near. How nowhere crazy. near. Yeah. At least for me. The, it was pretty benign. The crazy, the craziest thing we would see would be, uh, you know, uh, somebody with a skunk hair highlights <laughs> with their titty out in their little corset outfit. You know, like that was the craziest <laughs> thing that we saw. I, uh, I actually did see that one night. It was pretty. Funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of titties popping out of corsets. Yeah. <sighs> All right. It was like fucking French court back then. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all I got. I wish I was a club kid, but then I also don't. I'm yeah. I'm pretty happy with the way things turned out. <laughs> Same. Same. I don't I also I still don't want to see anyone drink urine. So, no, I'm good with that. I'm, I'm good. Fine. Yeah, I need good. that. Um, yeah, that's all I got. That was fun. Um, follow us on social media. Yay. DT at DTFU everywhere. Podcast. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I mean. Yeah, you know, you hear it every week. Um, if you haven't left us a review on iTunes, we would love if you did. So just throwing that out there. Um, tell a friend, uh, and yeah, that's, we hope to see you again next week. Not see you, but we hope to talk to you again next week because it is a joy and a treat. It is a treat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We love y'all very much. Um, We do. Be excellent to yourselves. And each other. (gasps) Yeah. Bye-bye. (laughs) Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'm going to get Bebe from Bebe's chambers now. (laughs) 